are gears. What you say, gears have teeth. Well, these gears have teeth, only they are invisible. See when the first wheel is spun, how the other wheels turn? Doesn't this action compare with that of an ordinary gear train? Actually, of course, the wheels are magnets, but made of alnico, a new alloy science has produced, which, unlike ordinary iron, can be permanently magnetized in sections. The markings indicate the magnetic poles given these wheels. The first wheel has two poles, the second wheel has four poles, and the third wheel has six poles. Now, since like poles repel and unlike poles attract, the magnetic fields present about the rim of each wheel act like teeth and so become the invisible teeth of these gears. Thus, if the wheels are set on properly spaced spindles, a magnetic gear train results. Since, too, there are an unlike number of poles, the middle wheel turns half as many times and the end wheel only a third as many times as the first wheel. Such toothless gears are impractical, of course, but they do show the unusual magnetic property of this new alloy. Here is a pair of electric eyes, photo tubes to be scientific, which can distinguish between much light and little light, as well as light of various colors. This model sorting machine shows the electric eyes at work, selecting black from white. A revolving wheel carries the balls under the eyes. Light from a small lamp in this housing is focused by a lens on the path of the balls. As a white ball appears, much light is reflected to the tubes and, of course, as a black ball appears, little light is reflected. The small electric current flowing through the phototubes is controlled by this reflected light. More light, more current. Less light, less current. Through another tube called a thyrotron, this small current controls an electric hammer, which in this model is set to strike out the black ball. One practical application of this device is an electric bean sorter in which beans to be sorted are fed into a container that leads them to a wheel having little holes on its rim. An air pump connected to the wheel creates a suction which holds the beans gently at each hole. As the wheel revolves, each bean is inspected by a pair of electric eyes. Any bean that does not reflect just the right amount of light is a bad bean and is knocked off the wheel immediately by the hammer. The good beans, those that do pass inspection, continue on the wheel to a point where the suction is momentarily released. Here the beans drop through a chute into a bag for weighing and shipment. Glass for lamps is made from soda ash, nitrate of soda, feldspar, lime, broken glass, and sand in this electric furnace at a temperature of 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. Clear bulbs are blown automatically, and these four spindles, timed perfectly to pass their charge to an equal number of cups, pick up just enough glass for each bulb. Spinning and turning, the glass begins to drop and form, while molds, through which compressed air is blown, and circle it. Actually, the bulbs are formed against a cushion of steam within the molds. As the molds open, they discard their perfectly fashioned bulbs, and then a conveyor belt carries them to a selector, which in turn feeds them to another unit, where blades of fire trim their necks to just the right length. Every bulb is inspected for such glass defects as blisters, bubbles, and strains. 
The perfect ones on the revolving tray are ready for inside frosting. Here you may see it being done as tray after tray of clear bulbs is fed into this electrically controlled machine. First the inside of the bulb is chemically etched. Then it receives a rinse. As the tray moves along, the bulbs get a second etching. With a final rinse, the bulbs are slowly dried and passed on for another inspection. Next, we see flanges being made from glass tubing. As the moving arms spin and revolve, intense fires play on the bottom of the tubing, softening it. When the glass is just the right consistency, this little spinning gadget makes a beveled edge or flare. Then an arm releases the tubing, which drops to the correct length so the flange may be cut to size. Filaments are made from sifted tungsten powder, which under extreme pressure becomes a fragile bar. After annealing, this bar is heated and forced through several reducing dyes until it becomes a wire, many feet in length and finer than a human hair. Our pointer shows the wire. This wire is then wound around another wire called mandrel after which it is cut to length. These lengths are placed in a coiled crucible and the mandrel is chemically eaten away. After drying in a small electric furnace, the filaments are carefully inspected for length and by means of an enlarging lens for evenness of coils. On this machine, a length of copper, a piece of dumet, wire with the same expansion coefficient as glass, and a strip of nickel are flash welded into the leading in wire to carry the current from the base to the filament. Next, the mount or heart of every lamp is assembled. Flanges are automatically fed into the carrier one at a time. Then a girl places two leading in wires in each flange. Here a glass exhaust tubing drops into place. Under intense heat, a seal is fused between the top of the flange and the center of the stem around the leading in wires. So that the air may later be exhausted, a hole is blown just below the seal. Then a small flat button is made at the end of the tubing. Simultaneously, three short support hooks for the filament are embedded in the softened glass. To ensure a better clamp, the end of the lead wire is flattened and then a hook is made in each flattened part. Now an operator places the coiled filaments in a traveling guide rack so that a bracket arm may drop the filament into place where a clamp is made. Then a second clamp is made and here come the finished mounts. Next, the bulb and mount are assembled. The operator places a mount in a chuck and a bulb on the revolving wheel. With the monogram and lamp rating stamped on, the bulb drops over one of the mounts and the trademark is burned in. When the glass is heated to the right degree, a clamp comes round and forms a perfect shoulder for fitting the base. This operation joins the mount and bulb while heat and gravity cause the superfluous glass to drop free. While traveling on this machine, a lamp gets a succession of evacuations and nitrogen gas flushes, but it is the last step that fills the lamp with argon gas and seals the stem. Lamp bases are filled with a cement which permits them to fit snugly to the end of the lamp. Girl operators place the bases over the ends of the lamps, straightening the ends of the lead wires as they do so. After the lead wires are cut to length, they are firmly soldered to the base, one at the side, one in the center. With a final over-voltage test for burnouts, the lamps are packed, ready to make your night as bright as your day. Music